going on in everybody's life that we need to just say, thank you, Lord. Sunshine. Sunshine, absolutely. And rain. And rain. Sunshine, absolutely. Oh, this time of year is beautiful for sure. What else? Family. Say again? Family. Family? Uh, you must have a better one than me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what else? Well, I was going to add church family. Church family. You know, that is very relevant to what we are going to talk to today. So we're going to say church family. What about prayer requests? What do we need to be praying for for everyone? Okay. Okay, Les Miller, post-surgery. What else? I think the sunshine has convinced us that there are no problems. Well, let's start in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to get together and spend some time in your word. Lord, you know not only the desires of our hearts, but the woes of our hearts. And Lord, we lift those up to you right now, and we trust that you are going to meet those needs and those desires right where they're at in ways that are going to surprise us because they are going to be your ways. And right now, Lord, we just pray that we can set those aside, and we invite you to join us as we dive into your word. It's not Paul's word. It's not Aaron's word. It is your word. And the only way that we can rightly understand it is if you instruct us. So send your spirit and illuminate to our hearts what it is that you would have us to know as we go through your word. In your precious name we pray, amen. All right, so we are looking at Philippians chapter 4 this afternoon. And probably the first thing that you noticed is that I am not Pastor John. <laughs> Pastor John um, has gone back to Mississippi to deal with some family things, and so in his absence I have been tasked to lead you guys through chapter 4 of Philippians. And he asked me to let you guys know and remind you that we're going to Colossians next. Um, I think he hinted at some homework, but I'm not sure about that. So let's look at, at Philippians 4. Now, Philippians 4 starts with a therefore. And a therefore usually means that we've got to go back and look at what the therefore is a response to. And unfortunately, Pastor John already covered that therefore last week. But the unfortunate part of it is it's one of my favorite verses. And so we are going to re -re recover it again this morning. So we're going to go back into chapter 3 to verse 17. And we're going to start there. Brothers. Join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it was news to me to discover that my wife's vision for our wedding was a little bit different than my future mother-in-law's vision for our wedding, which puts the groom in an awkward position. My mother-in-law wanted a flower arch. We'll, we'll, we'll get... <laughs> if I only knew of that alliance then. My mother-in-law wanted a flower arch at the beginning of the sanctuary so that the, the bride and father would have to walk under that arch down the aisle towards me. My wife did not want that arch. And so while my wife was saying, can't we get rid of the arch, can't we get rid of the arch, my mother-in-law was saying, the arch isn't right, the arch isn't right. So I finally had a moment of clarity, and I turned to my best man. 
And I said, Matt, that arch has to come up missing. And he said, well, what do you want me to do with it? And I said, well, the trick is I can't know because when my mother-in-law asks me where's the arch, I've got to be able to sell that I don't know. So fast forward a few moments, and my mother-in-law is wandering around going, where's the arch? Where's the arch? And I looked over to my best man, and he went, to this day, I don't know what happened to that arch. But one of my eternal memories that I, I hope to take with me into the hereafter is of my father-in-law walking my wife down the aisle. Our photographer, one of the best photos that she took was of that moment. My wife is my joy and my crown. And I suspect that we all know what it means to be or to have a joy and a crown, as Paul is describing here. And Paul is describing that the people of Philippians, the Christians, the believers there, are his joy and his crown. Could we say that about our church family? If we were to give ourselves a grade, and I'm not asking us to do that, but if we were to give ourselves a grade, would we describe one another as our joy and our crown? Or would we have to say, hey, maybe we should have to, per hey, I want you to continue to persevere in this family because it's for your own good. It shouldn't be perseverance. We should be one another's joy and one another's crown. In fact, Jesus talks about this. The writer of Hebrews describes it this way. He wants us to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know that the joy that was set before Jesus as he went to the cross, is sitting in this very room. You are the joy that was before Jesus. Isn't that a powerful thought? And here Paul is encouraging the Ephesians to imitate him in imitating Jesus. For Paul, excuse me, the Philippians, for Paul, the Philippians were his joy and his crown. And that's precisely because the Philippians were Jesus' joy and crown when he was at the cross. Each one of us is a reward unto him or herself. So he says, My joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. What does it mean to stand firm? Of course, with my background, I always think of that in terms of a military background. You see it in the movie all the times when the, the enemy is approaching, the odds are bleak, and the commander is saying, hold, hold, stand firm, guys, we've got this. But the only way that that works, the only way that that works is if the thing that we are standing firm in is bigger than what we are risking. In order to stand firm, whatever it is that you're standing firm in has to be bigger than what it is that you are facing. We're not standing firm and hoping for prosperity. We're not standing firm and hoping for health. We are standing firm and hoping for an eternal reward in the hereafter. To believe in Christ is to have eternal life, and that is what we are standing firm in. And if it is true that what we are standing firm in is bigger than your individual life, then the exhortation to stand firm becomes a hope regardless of whatever you, what, it, what it is that you are facing. Our church is an elder church. How do I, as a younger gentleman, go to the hospital and tell you to stand firm when you are on death's door and I am not? 
It's only because what I'm asking you to stand firm in is bigger than my life and bigger than your life. So, beloved, let us act like we are one another's beloveds and let us encourage one another to stand firm. Moving on in Philippians, verse 2. Well, I'm going to run out of time. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Sintish to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in any, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone. Now, some of your translations may read a little different. I have the NIV reads, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The NRSV reads, Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. The ISV reads, Let your gracious attitude be known to all people. The Lord is near. And then the message reads, Make it as clear as you can, can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. So how do we account for those differences? So there I was. Fort Knox, Kentucky, executive officer for 600 cadets who are so new to the Army they do strange things and the stress is high. I'm also trying to work my, wealth, my way through seminary, and so I've got assignments that are due and readings that have to be done. And so to balance that, I would actually leave the base and go to the Barnes & Noble in town and sit down at their little coffee shop, and that's where I would do my studies. Nobody knew I was there, so they couldn't bug me, and then I would go back to base when I was done doing my studies. So I showed up one day, and it was packed. There wasn't a seat to be found. It turns out in that little community outside of the base, the teenagers don't go to the movies. They go to Barnes & Noble, order a coffee, and have a conversation. And it was Friday night, and so that's what they were doing. And there were no places to sit. So I looked around, and I found a single table with one person at it, and it was an elderly gentleman with a beard all the way down to here, and he was studying a tome about this thick. And so I thought, okay, he's got a lot of work to do. I'm going to sit down with him. He will, well, we, I'm sure we can come to an agreement. If I leave you alone, you can leave me alone, and we can get our work done. And sure enough, that's what we worked out. And so he and I sat there for a couple hours, him working on what he was working on, and I working on what I was working on. And then finally he asked, what are you studying? And I said, well, I'm, I've got to write a paper on why it is important to understand the context of the message that we're studying is. And he said, oh, that's interesting. After a couple more moments, he said, what, a, what, what would I be telling you if I told you that I was abaft of the binnacle? And I said, I don't know. I understand that uh, abaft is a nautical term. I think it means behind. I don't know what the binnacle is, but it sounds nautical. So I'm guessing that you're behind the binnacle. And he said, well, what if I told you that the binnacle is that cabinet on the ship that houses the compass? And I would say, okay, you're standing behind the compass. And he said, no, what I'm telling you is that I'm not feeling very well. And it comes from the old wooden sailing ships when the English were traveling around the world. And the, 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 if you were sick you would go to the first officer and the first officer would say, okay, report to the doctor. And then he would, you would go down to the doctor and the doctor would determine whether or not you were ready or, 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 or able to work. And if you were not, he would put your name on a list. 
the first officer then at the beginning of the next shift would go down to the doctor and he would say, give me the list. And he would take it up and he would pin it to the back of that cabinet that the compass is in. That way, when the captain came out of his quarters, he would pull that up and he could see what the status of his crew was. And so to say that you are abaft of the binnacle means your name is on this list because you're not feeling very well. So how do we translate that into English? We've got a couple of options. We can go with a very direct translation in which we write abaft of the binnacle. We know it's a euphemism. We could, we could substitute one euphemism for another euphemism. Instead of saying a baft of the binnacle, we could say you are under the weather. But again, you'd have to know that context. Or we could go with a literal translation where we say, I'm not feeling well. There are people who would accuse you either way of not being true to the original message. But when we look at our English translations, each one is using a different approach. And so what we've got to do to understand what's going on here, and my favorite technique is to open up a couple of different translations, because I don't speak Greek directly. And then you can kind of, if you read them all, understand what is being said here. So Paul is telling us, in my translation, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. In the ISV, or the NIV, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. What this means, I had a good friend who decided, um, he, he was a professing believer and then decided that he was an atheist. And on Facebook, he was interacting on all of those um, atheist Facebook groups. And I still wanted to reach out to my friend and present the argument for Christ. But if you've been in any of those atheist groups, you know they can be very hostile to any kind of um, religious argument. So I decided I'm going to be as gentle and respectful as I possibly can. No matter what I do in this conversation, I'm going to act as if I have been invited into their home. And so when they would say something, I would respond with, thanks for sharing. Or I appreciate that perspective. Or that's interesting, tell me a little bit more. And then when I would present my argument, I would say things like, have you considered? What if it's not like that, but what if it's like this? You know, I like what you said, but this part of it here, wouldn't that be better for all of us? What Paul is telling us is that we have to be reasonable. We have to be able to present our argument so that it's understandable. And it has to make sense. But we also have to do it gently. We are actually offering the world something that is very beneficial to them. I wish I could say that I had won my friend over. But I got to the point where I had to just back out of those groups. It was very confrontational. It was stressful. I was still working through my, 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 my seminary school and my job. I didn't need that. And so I left. And when I left, four other people actually reached out to me and said, I had never heard that argument before. Could I ask you a few more questions? So what Paul is telling us is that we have to be reasonable, reasonable and we have to be gentle so that we will be heard. All right, any thoughts, questions so far? Oh, man. Pastor John told me I could, if it didn't take the whole hour, then that was okay. <laughs> All right, moving on. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you.
How many, of you, how many are familiar with the concept of combat breathing? I wouldn't expect that. That's okay. Combat breathing is a way that you can control your own anxiety. When you find yourself anxious, it's really simple. You take a deep breath, hold it at the top for a second, and then exhale it slowly. If you're anxious about anything, combat breathing is where I start. So I was dispatched one morning to arrest a guy who had been um, charged with assaulting his wife. She, he'd actually beat her up pretty good the night before, and they didn't find him. And I was supposed to go to his house and look for him, and if I saw him, I needed to arrest him. I dealt with this guy before. I happened to know that he was seven feet tall and 300 pounds. So instantly, I'm a little bit anxious. So I park my car about two houses away, and I get out of my car, and I sneak up, and I can see in this giant open bay window, there he is, asleep on the couch, all seven feet of him and 300 pounds. And I'm shaking. I actually went back to my police car. I was like, I can't do this. I need backup. But I already knew that there was no backup. And so I stopped, and I remembered combat breathing. And I started to control my own anxiety. I went back. I tested the door, and it was unlocked. I threw it open, went in, rolled him onto the floor, landing on his face, put the handcuffs on him before he could even wake up. And then I walked back to my police car and told everybody at the jail how tough I was. <laughs> There's two things about this passage that I love. The first one is this is the spiritual combat breathing section. Do you want to know what you do when you're struggling spiritually? You've got to think about things that are true, things that are honorable, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are commendable, things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise. And the second thing I love is when Paul says, practice these things. As if we're not supposed to be experts on them already. I just want you to practice. You don't, you don't have to get it right every single time. But when you find yourself in a bad spot, remember you're supposed to do this and then practice it. My little brother is a runner by nature. When he runs, you just look at him and you say, oh my gosh, that's what running is supposed to look like. I'm not a runner by nature. I have to remind myself, the tireder I get, the more hunched over I get as I'm running. And I have to remind myself, stand up straight. Practice standing with your chest up. Practice breathing right, because I'm not very good at it. And that's what Paul is telling us right here. Practice, practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Picking up in verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I, or not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Which is harder? To be content in a period of want or to be content in a period of plenty? About two-thirds through um, my second deployment in Iraq, I was having trouble sleeping. And uh, I had one of those jobs where I had to kind of be able to think about what I was doing, and so the less you sleep, the more challenging your job becomes. And everybody kept telling me, um, you're in a combat zone, of course you're having trouble sleeping. And I kept saying, no, no, I've been here before. So the doctor gave me a sleep aid, and I took it that first night, and I woke up that next morning, and... Uh, 
It worked so well, I had no idea where I was. I woke up, and to get out of bed, I walked into the wall. And just to be sure, I walked into it again. That's how out of it I was when I woke up. And so I couldn't do that either. And so I continued to struggle to sleep. And then one day, a good friend of mine, he says, Hey, Aaron, um, you haven't heard back from your boss yet. Because I was a National Guard soldier, I actually had a civilian job back home. And I, they were going through a reorganization. And at a certain point, I wasn't sure if I still had a job. And so I sent an email and said, Hey, do I have a job? And I hadn't heard anything, and I hadn't heard anything. And my, bo my buddy said, hey, um, you haven't heard from your boss. Why don't you reach out from him? And so I did, or reach out to him. And so I did. And my boss said, oh, no, you're, you are one of our best assets, Aaron. You've got a job. Don't worry about it. And instantly I was able to sleep. Now I tell that story for two reasons. I tell it for, for one reason because in my life that was very much a period of want. And I struggled to find contentedness in the midst of it. And so finding contentedness in want is hard. But I also share that story because I'm a firm believer. People look at me and say, you went to war, that must have been hard. Do you know what's hard? Making sure you have a job for your family when you care. Making sure you're balancing your job with your family because you care. Making the stressing out about the decisions that your family is making because you care. These are on par when we talk about want and when we talk about struggling through those kinds of things. We are still supposed to find contentment in the midst of that, and it is hard. But let me tell you where I am today. Last night was bath night at my house. And my daughter, we love to put her in the kitchen sink. We've got a giant kitchen sink, and we, both my wife and I don't have to bend over, and so our backs are good, and she loves it. We put the little dock -a tot on the, on, the, on the stove. We put her in there. We take her clothes off. The whole time she's going, bath, 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 bath. And when you get her down to her diaper, she literally jumps into your arms in her anxiousness to get into the sink. I love it. Every moment of it. I wish I could stop it just to stay there. I turned on some Elvis Presley because it's fun and my, wife, my daughter likes the beat. And so now we're splashing and, and, and just dancing and having a great time. Today, I spent all day preparing for this study and for two sermons that I've got coming up. And you guys paid me for that. It is hard for me to fathom. And yet... I'm struggling to find contentedness because I'm waiting for that other shoe to drop. It's coming. Many of you have experienced it. With great joy comes the opportunity for great sorrow. And so even when we find ourselves in the midst of great joy, we have trouble finding that contentedness that Paul is speaking about here. So I ask you again, which one is harder, to be content in want or to be content in plenty? And I would argue that the hardest one is the one that you're in right now wherever you are. So how do we do that? Verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Did you know, many of you know, the privilege that is walking through this life with the creator of the universe. Every one of us knows that. And it's hard for us to fathom the loneliness that comes in thinking that we would have to walk through this life without him present in our lives. It's not some magical strength that he gives us. It's just that moment when we recognize that he is here and he is in charge. All right. Any questions, thoughts, or inputs? Okay.
Excellent. Well, and I think it ties in well, too, with that whole idea of, of, of gentleness and respectfulness. Um, we really have something to offer that you cannot find anywhere else. And that's the opportunity to walk with Jesus. And that family feel, you know, I, uh, my little brother, um, he met his wife online. And if you're watching right now, Casey, I apologize. Um, and so his wife was from Cincinnati, and so the wedding was in Cincinnati, and our whole family had to go to Cincinnati. Um, and I actually, um, Sarah had dumped me at that point, and so we weren't dating then. And so I found a date for the wedding in Cincinnati. And uh, when she came to the wedding and was interacting with my family, when, when, I found, when it was done and I said goodbye, she was in tears. And she was in tears because she said, your family actually loves one another and cares about one another and wants to be in one another's presence. And that's what we should be striving for as a church body as well. And, and, and that's what it means to be a joy and to be a crown. Now, if you spend any time with my family, you're going to discover that yeah, that's not always the case. I am a lot like my dad, and the older I get, the more I find myself yelling at him in the way, same ways he's yelling at me. In fact, we'll start a conversation at a low decibel, and by the time we're really into it, it's at a very high decibel. We're not angry with one another, but we just have a tendency not to hear one another. And so that, but that's, that is good to hear, because that's what we are going for, and that's what we're striving for. And, and, and the truth is, we are. If it is true that the crown or the joy that was before Jesus on the cross was you, and you have accepted him, and now Paul is exhorting us through the Philippians to imitate him imitating Jesus, and he's calling us his crown and joy. The implication is that we are supposed to be one another's crowns and joys. And that's, that's how we know we're doing it right. Good job. Great. All right, moving on. Shoot. I, don't, I, I agree with you 100%. And the thing that's fascinating, if, if it, we cannot, you cannot be content without Jesus. If that is true, we've found the secret to contentment. My phone is on the table right there, and if I found a really good app, I would tell you all. And yet we struggle to tell people that we have found the secret to contentment. Now, we, we can't go... It, it, if we were to just run down the street shouting at everybody, they would think that we were crazy. And if we tell people, in fact, I think I lost a good friend by telling, some, telling him over and over and over again that he needed Jesus. It got to the point where he didn't want to hang out with me because he knew what I was going to say. And that's, again, going back to what Paul is talking about with that gentleness and that reasonableness. We have to be aware of where we're at, and we have to be gentle and, and, and appreciate the other person at the same hand. But... We have to remember that we have the secret to contentment in Jesus Christ, and you can find that nowhere else. All right, picking up in verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. 
And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, have received from Aphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now one of the reasons I took the job that I'm in right now is because it came with Pastor John. Pastor John has been doing this for a long time. I'm transitioning into something new, and I wanted to be successful. And so when I found out this job was open, and it came with a mentor, I was like, I'm all in. One of the things that John has talked about in our mentoring sessions over and over and over again is the ability or the experience of watching people grow in Christ. And I know you know it too. I haven't been a pastor, but I have some good friends who I have got to watch grow in Christ. One of my best friends, I called him up and said, I am going to start, I'm pursuing a master's in divinity with an emphasis in theology. And he said, why would you want to do that? He's an FBI agent, and at the time, um, we, we, bo we were both in law enforcement, and I told him, you know, at the second coming of Christ, we're out of work. But he recently, within the last few years, called me and said he was going to pursue a counseling degree with an emphasis in theology. And I, 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 it was so funny. I said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> and he is on fire for God. He is, he is involved in Awanas and teaching his kids about the Bible and just watching a person grow. That is the gift that Paul was asking for. And we, I get it. Um, a good 60% of my time is discussing budgets and who's got what money and how are we going to adjust that so we can do what it is that we want to do. But ultimately, we are here for the fruit of righteousness. The righteousness that has been given to you through Christ is to be shared so that other people will grow in that righteousness as well. And Paul is saying that's, that is what it is that we seek. Verse 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And I ended on that right there because that phrase, especially those of Caesar's household, when we talk about watching or, or planting the seeds that grow into the fruit of righteousness and salvation, it is always surprising who that is. We think it's one person that we are pouring our, our, our souls into. And it turns out it was somebody completely different. And in this case, it was Caesar's household that is hearing the gospel because they went and threw Paul in prison. Thoughts? Questions? All right, now, before John left, he told me I wasn't allowed to change anything in his absence. So I've got some funnies. My brother once stopped um, a police officer who was on the side of the road, um, and he knew I was a police officer, and he really just wanted to tell this police officer that he appreciated everything that, I, that, that they do for him. And when he got out of his car and he went to that police car, the police officer jumped out of the car and with his hand on his hip said, back away, back away, back away. And so my brother backed away, got into his car, drove away, and called me. And I said, Jason, you have no idea what that guy just came from. So all of these are real reports found in the police blotters of what our men and women in blue have to deal with on a daily basis. A woman in the 1900 block of 129th Lane Northeast reported on October 15 that someone must have stolen her mail because she did not receive birthday cards from some of her friends. <laughs> At 8.29 p.m., police received a call from a Du Bois woman who said she smelled something funny in her room last night. She believed it might be her husband. 
Two students of unspecified gender told police they were assaulted in some way on their way home from an unspecified school by an unspecified number of assailants, perhaps sustaining unspecified injuries or none at all. The police couldn't really say. A man who lived in Fairfield filed a complaint with police on Sunday about someone ringing his doorbell and leaving a photocopy of buttocks on his front step. The complainant, a one Edgar Butts, told police the incident has happened several times. <laughs> the Learning Center on Hanson Street reports a man across the way stands at his windows for hours watching the center, making parents very nervous. Police responded and identified the suspect as a cardboard cutout of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Police were informed February 25th by a resident of the thousand block of Ruritan Drive that a family in the area is taking over the minds of local dogs and turning them against their owners. Police were advised by the person that the only way to protect a dog is to install an anti-force field on its head before letting the animal go outside. I feel like I went to that call. A Grand Rapids resident told police last week that someone had entered his home during the night and taken five pounds of bacon from the refrigerator. Upon investigation, it was discovered his wife had gotten up for a late night snack and was afraid to admit it. <laughs> a caller reported at 7.14 p.m. that someone was on the porch yelling help. Officers responded and learned that the person was calling for a cat that they had named help. Finally, police were called to Market Square for a report about a suspicious coin. The investigating officer determined that it was a quarter. All right. Hey, when you guys go this week and when, you're in act when you are interacting with one another, when you find it difficult to remember that they are your joy and crown, at least remember that they are Jesus' joy and his crown. And go with that as you go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, next week is Colossians. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You are awesome. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> All right, well, I was. Well, yeah, you probably relate to my story.